Today is the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. And the epistle is taken from that according to St. Paul to the Ephesians chapter 4. Brethren, I, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation in which you are called, with all humility and mildness, with patience, supporting one another in charity, careful to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, one body and one spirit, as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in us all, who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. And the gospel. gospel. Taking that according to St. Matthew chapter 22. At that time the Pharisees came to Jesus, and one of them, a doctor of the law, asked him, tempting him, Master, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, with thy whole soul, with thy whole mind. This is the greatest in the first commandment, and the second is like unto this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments dependeth the whole of the law and the prophets. And the Pharisees being gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think you of the Christ? Whose son is he? And they say to him, David's. He said to them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. If David then called him Lord, how is he his son? No man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forward ask him any more questions. Let's call the words of today's holy gospel. So my first Sunday back in Iloilo five years now, and so it's so good to be back, but uh, here are just a few blocks away from the church, but not at the church, and uh, it's good to be here back in, 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 uh, in Iloilo on a Sunday, and uh, at least five years since being here. Uh, for Sunday, I was here a few days ago uh, for a short visit, and then now I'm here today. But in any case, Today, the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, we are heading towards the end, beginning that journey towards the final judgment, which is the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, the day in which Jesus Christ will come to judge the living and the dead. So we've passed the halfway mark, and we are beginning that journey towards the end, towards the judgment. These 24 Sundays after Pentecost, they are the history of the church, beginning with its birthday on Pentecost, ending with the judgment and the last day of Jesus Christ, the blowing of the trumpets, coming down to judge the living and the dead uh, on the last day of the world, during approximately 2,000 years between the coming of Jesus Christ and his second coming. We are getting closer to that second coming now, and there are some signs signs of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of them is the changing of the source of unity. In the epistle today, St. Paul reminds us of the bond of peace and of the unity of our church. Remember the vocation which you are called, it says in the Ephesians. Keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. One body and one spirit as you are called and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. What is our unity? Our unity is in God. Our unity is in the faith. Our unity is in the Lord. It is said many times. One Lord, one faith. One baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is above all and through all. Where does the faith come from? It is that which comes from the mouth of God. The baptism. What does the baptism make us? 
It makes us members of the body of Jesus Christ, members of the, of, of the kingdom of the one God. Our unity as Catholics and our unity as men can only be in the one Lord, in the one faith, in the one baptism. One of the grave errors of our world today is that man is trying to find another source of unity. We all want to be one. John Paul II wrote an encyclical, Ut Unum Saint, that they may be one. Don't we all want to be one? And it is interesting that today in the Navasaro churches, and today in the, in the government, and today in all of the parts of the world, we are talking about one world. We need one world government. We need unity between the religions. We need harmony and unity amongst men. We want unity and unity and peace and unity and peace and unity. This is what we want. And we believe we can find that peace and unity amongst ourselves. That's one of the reasons why in a new mass, the priest turns and faces the people he worships the people, and the people look at the priest, and the priest looks at the people, and as they look at each other, God is forgotten, and God is no longer the source of unity. And finally, the people get tired of looking at the priest, because it turns out he's not that handsome. And the people, the priest, he gets tired of looking at the people. And so the people want to have their turn to be looked at, and so up comes a woman to do the reading. Up comes another man to do his reading. Up comes a Eucharistic minister. Up comes a man that they might sing. Everybody wants to take turns standing in front of everyone else so that we can all celebrate each other. But when one million people get together to celebrate each other, what happens is a war. There can be no unity. If my unity is you and your unity is me, then one day I'm not going to be happy with you and you're not going to be happy with me because we have to have equal time. My time to give a talk, your time to give a talk. Like in modern marriages, the mother says it's my time to nurse the baby and tomorrow it's your time to nurse the baby. It's my time to watch, your time to watch. My time to cook, your time to cook. We're going to share. And what happens? War. That's what happens. Whenever we seek unity in men, we will have no unity at all. Should we not be united? Why can't we all be one? Why are we divided? Our unity is in God. Our unity is in the one Lord, in the one faith, in the one baptism. Our unity is in the one God and the one Father of all. We look up and we see that one God. You look at the Latin Mass. During the course of this Mass, we are all united. During this Mass, yourselves, the faithful, and me, the priest, we are all worshiping Jesus Christ upon the cross. Our eyes are upon Him. And He is our source of unity. We are looking to Him. And if we look to each other for our unity, then there will never be unity. We have changed what we want to find unity in. There can only be unity in God there cannot be unity in man. There cannot be unity in money. There cannot be unity in power. There cannot be unity in pleasure. There cannot be unity in food. All these things are going to be causes of division. Modern man says everybody should have their own house. Everybody should have their own car. Everybody should have their own swimming pool. Everybody should be living together in their own community, all with equal shares, all with equal time, all with equal, and if everybody has the same car, and everybody has the same McDonald's hamburger, and everybody has the same serving of rice, 
and everybody has the same clothes, and everybody has the same things in every respect, we will have a peaceful and happy society. What if your body did that? What if you woke up in the morning on Monday and you walked on your feet? And then on Tuesday you woke up in the morning and the feet said, I am tired. I walked yesterday and you hands and you arms did nothing. You just hung there. It's your turn. And so on Tuesday you walk on your hands. On Wednesday you walk on your two fingers. On Thursday you walk on your thumbs. On Friday you walk on your nose. And by Saturday, you are in the grave or an insane asylum. We do not share. The hands do not share the work of the feet. The feet do not share the work of the hands. How are they united? They are united in one life principle, in one soul. They are united in one creator. They are united in one goal. And then they work together. The hands bring the food to the mouth. The mouth digests and tears up the food. It goes to the stomach. The stomach then sends the nutrients of that food throughout the body. And there is great unity in the body because the unity of the body is not in equal time. And the unity of the body is not in the body. When the body is only united in itself, it is called death. When the soul, which is the life, one principle of the body, when the soul goes away, the body decays. And what is the soul of the world that keeps the world together? What is the soul of our holy church that keeps the church united? That soul is the Holy Ghost, the holy breath of life. The holy breath of life that breathes throughout the entirety of the soul. So that when you come to Mass, someone sits in the front pew, someone sits in the back pew, someone takes the collection, someone serves at the Mass, someone celebrates the Mass, someone sets up for the Mass, someone constructs the building, someone provides the food after the Mass. And there is great harmony. Because each one does a different thing that is united to the same goal, and that goal is Christ. That is one of the reasons why Holy Week should be a great reminder of the unity of our church. Every one of us during Holy Week has to do something. Clean the church, polish the candlesticks, get ready for Holy Saturday, prepare the food and the candies, prepare the flowers for the altar. Everyone is doing a different work, and it all comes together at midnight, it all comes together around midnight on Holy Saturday night, and there is a great rejoicing because we have all done these things harmoniously together in order that there might be a worship of the one Lord, the one faith, the one baptism, the one Lord, the one Father of all. We begin to be distracted if we begin to believe that the unity of our humanity the unity of our world, the unity of our church, or the unity of our little society of St. Pius X and Catholic tradition, we begin to make a mistake if we believe that these unities can be without one faith, without one and the same Lord. It is not the most important thing that we stay together. It is the most important thing that we be united to God. It is the most important thing that our mind believes in Him, that our hearts love Him, that our bodies follow His will. This is the most important thing. And when we all do this, there can only be one result, a perfectly harmonious and unified world. Look at all the other elements made by God in the natural universe. They are all so different, whether it be the sun that is hot and 93 million miles away, or the leaves of the tree that are green, or the bark, or the wood that is very hard, or the soil that is very um, uh, broken apart and has nutrients in it. They are so different, but they are one. They are united in their obedience to their Lord. They are united in the way that they give glory to their God. 
They're united in when each one of them does their own different tasks. And this is their unity. Now what is the chief commandment in the gospel it is said today? What is the chief commandment? Love God. No Lord Jesus Christ always answers more. St. Ambrose says, when Jesus Christ answers a question, he always answers more. He always answers in a superabundance. And therefore, when that man asked him, who wanted to betray, who wanted to trap him, Master, which is the greatest commandment? He answered more than what was asked, says St. Ambrose. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God. But the second is like unto it, and that is to love the neighbor as the self for the love of God. And it is that which confirms the first and is the proof of the first. St. John Chrysostom tells us, or rather St. John of the Cross tells us, no man can say that he loves God who does not love a tree. No man can say that he loves God that does not love his creation. And no man can say that he loves God who does not open his eyes and see the God of the Creator inside of the beautiful tree that he made. When a man opens his eyes, he looks at a tree. When a man opens his eyes and looks at a mountain. When a man opens his eyes and looks at the clouds, and looks at the stars, and looks at all the beautiful things that God has made, one is naturally lifted up to the Creator. And one sees it is God who made these beautiful things. God made them for his own glory. God made them for our help in order to get to heaven. And these things should call us to the various attributes and gifts of God, powers of God. And then they should also make us want to love God and live in harmony with God like all of the creatures. Like one day, St. Anthony. St. Anthony was preaching to the people in Italy in a certain town. And they would not listen to him. They would not listen to St. Anthony. They were heretics. And he preached for three days. And the more he preached, the more they refused to listen. Until they all walked away. And as they refused to listen, Anthony preached more and more. He refused to stop preaching. Finally, after three days, he went down to the ocean. Where the river flows into the ocean. And he said, O oh, ye fishes, come forth and hear the word of God. And the fishes came out of the ocean. Thousands and thousands of fishes came out of the ocean. Other fishes came out of the river. And they all stuck their head out of the river. And they looked at Anthony. And Anthony said, O oh, you fishes, you have no brains. You have no reason. But you are smarter than these men of this city. For you give glory to your God, and God's word must be preached, God's truth must be spoken, and if men will not listen, listen, then I command you fishes to hear the word of God. And they all bowed their heads whenever he said the name of Jesus in his sermon, and the more and more fishes came. And the fishes began to get closer to the, to the shore, and they began to fill so that you could only see thousands and thousands of fishes, each of them looking at St. Anthony and listening to him preach about the Word of God. There was a young boy watching the fishes speak to Anthony, and he ran back into the city, and he said, Anthony, Anthony is speaking to the fishes. You would not listen to Anthony? And so the fishes listened to Anthony, and the people came out to see the miracle. And he preached to the fishes about the glory of water. And he preached to the fishes about the glory of being a fish. And he said, oh, you fish, how blessed you are. For you live inside of that element of water, which is the element that God used to purify the world at the great flood and wipe out sin. And God preserved you from the great horror of the deluge. While all the other animals died, God let you live. Give thanks to God that he lets you live the great flood. And you are the element. You live in the element of water, which he uses for holy baptism. What a great privilege to swim in the water in which Christ uses to purify souls and bring them to him. And your greatest glory, O fishes, 
is that on the day, third day after Jesus Christ died, he rose from the dead. And what did he do to prove to his apostles that he was truly risen from the dead? He took of your flesh. He took of the meat of a fish. And he ate of the meat of the fish. And he proved by the eating of the meat of a fish that he was really a man. That he was really a body. That he truly rose from the dead. And this is your greatest glory, O ye fish. That you were used by Jesus Christ, God made man, to prove his resurrection to all men. Be proud of being fish. So Anthony preached to the fish. What is the unity of fishes? What is the unity of birds? What is the unity of all creatures? Their unity and their goodness is found in God. The one Lord, the one faith, the one baptism. And the great tragedy of today inside of our holy Catholic Church is that Catholic bishops, Catholic priests, and our holy Catholic Pope, what are they doing? They are trying to find unity in the United Nations, which is straight from hell. They are trying to find unity in the rights and dignity of man, which is absolute foolishness. They are trying to find unity in the teachings of modern science, which is the te teachings of modern idiots who before they burn in hell shall receive a special place of mockery for their stupidity. The science that should have led the scientists to God, they have used their science to try to deceive men, and they shall receive a special place in hell. These idiotic evolutionists, these idiotic modern scientists, who see God every day in the atoms and molecules, who see God every day in the magnificence of the creatures that he created, who see God every day in the perfection of all the things that he made, and how they work in perfect harmony. And these fools say, it came by chance. These fools say, we are the only ones that make it make sense. They think reason comes from a scientist who is a fool, and they shall have a special place in hell to burn. And they are going to try to find a new unity, the unity of modern science, the unity of modern medicine, the unity of, of modern economics and modern money. And we're going to see what's going to happen in the very near future with the unity of our money. You have confidence in your banks? Your banks are making you slaves. You have confidence in your dollars? You have confidence in your credit cards, you have confidence in your bank accounts, behold, they shall collapse, and when they collapse, who shall save you? We can only be saved by God. In fact, when the difficulties come in the near future, it may be the greatest mercy of God. For one of the mysteries of man is that when we are doing well, we go to hell. And when we are doing badly, we go to God. It is one of the mysteries of the mysterious foolishness of man. If we fall off our horse and are blinded like St. Paul, we are open to the grace of God. But if we are rich and we are successful and we are healthy and we are strong and we are popular, in this way we find ourselves easily ready to collapse because we begin to believe it is not the one Lord who blesses us, it is not the one faith that preserves us, but it is my greatness inside of myself. And we begin to look for another source of the unity of our lives. Because when our unity is in God, whether we are rich or poor, smart or foolish, no matter where we fit in the scheme of things, king or slave, we must all obey God. And when we become powerful, we don't want to obey Him anymore. What is our unity? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. What is the effect of this unity? The love of God and the love of all the things that He created. That is why our Lord Jesus Christ says, the first great commandment is to love God. But if you really love Him, you will love His creation. Starting with the creature that He loves the most, which is man. Why God loves us more than anything else is a great mystery. 
Dogs are always good. Men are not. Rocks are reliable. Men are not. Angels don't change their minds. Men have no idea what to do with their minds. Why does God love us more than anything else? But if God loves us more than anything else, and we say we love God, then it is most necessary that we prove that love by the love of our neighbor. And therefore, one thing that you can expect. Already, many people that go to my Mass, or go to Father Giselle's Mass, they are being persecuted. In America, some of the people that have gone to our Mass, they have been told they cannot return. They have been told to take their children out of the school. They have been told to take their children out of the serving. They have been told they can no longer serve Mass. They have been given threats of being expelled from the parish. What do we do? Render good for evil. Do not have any vengeance. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ said, the day will come when they throw you out of the synagogues. Thinking they do a service to God. This is one of those days. We are thrown out of the churches. And those that throw us out are convinced they do a service to God. And a little text message sent around yesterday. Don't attend the masses. The Father Giselle and Father Pfeiffer on their way to Cebu and Behold. We were there yesterday. Because they are using the mass for the purpose of profanation and sacrilege. Profanation and sacrilege. Each day, there is an escalation of accusations. But what are we to do? We do not stand upon anything other than the truth. We do not stand upon anything other than the unity of faith. And this faith demands that we love God. And that if we are persecuted a little because of the love of God, it is to our glory. It is nothing to be disturbed about. And we should not be frustrated in spirit. But we must make sure to return good. To return good. You find that because you have gone to Mass here, that the people won't talk to you anymore. They shun you. You do not shun them. Remember in the early days of our church, the way in which souls were brought to God was by charity. See the Christians, how they love one another. This charity is beginning to grow cold in our chapels. It's beginning to grow cold in tradition. We have become accustomed to the gifts that God has given us. And we are no longer grateful. As Father Hannafin, my old pastor in Kentucky, used to say, don't take your faith for granted. Always be grateful for what God has given you. The trouble with us Catholics is we take our great faith for granted. We think that we earned it. We think that we deserve it. We think that we possess it securely. But without the grace of God, any one of us can lose it. Remember, our unity is in faith. Our unity is in the one Lord, the one God, the one Father of all. And we will not strive for any false unity in any other thing. Even if that thing is the so-called name of tradition. Our unity is in our holy Roman Catholic faith, which is one and undivided. Even if, unfortunately, in our tragic times, so many Catholics are divided. And we must also remember, always render charity. Many of those that condemn us, many of those that despise us, many of those that hate us or wonder about us, they do not know. They are misinformed. They have good wills. They do not desire, they do not under desire any particular evil. They don't understand. God will judge their souls which ones are guilty and which ones are innocent, only he knows. We assume that all are innocent. And we stand firm upon the truth and upon the faith. And we have confidence that our Lord will bless us as long as we say in unity of faith and don't allow any other kind of false unity to get in the way. And that we try to live according to charity towards our neighbors. And God will bless us. And God will bless our work. We pray that he make us always remain faithful to him until we die. When our lady comes, 
when our Lord comes, that they will be there on the day of our death. We want to die the friends of Christ, the friends of Mary. This is best done by keeping a little devotion to St. Joseph. St. Joseph is the one who was who uh, bad Mary and our Lord Jesus Christ at his deathbed. So we pray to Joseph for a happy and holy death. We pray Joseph in his quiet way to put the faith inside of us. That Joseph preserve us. That Joseph protect us. That Joseph provide for us in all our needs until we pass to eternity. To be the friends of God. Close the deck of us all. And the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.